Hi, I'm Carrie Percy. I teach graphic arts at Kaiser University, but I'm also a professional photographer. And I'd like to teach you a little bit about food photography and how you can do it on little to no budget and if you have a great camera. So first I want to talk to you about taking pictures, simple pictures with your iPhone or iPad or your smartphone. Um, pictures that could be easily used on the web, um, places like Pinterest. And also, I would like to show you how to use a DSLR to take good food photography. So let's get started. Let's talk about gear. So what is gear? It's the stuff that's going to help you make these beautiful photos. So one thing you need is a camera of some sort. My suggestion is start small. If you have a smartphone, start with that. Eventually, you're going to want to work your way up to a DSLR camera to take your pictures, especially if you need them to be high resolution for print publishing like magazines and cookbooks. But for web, it's perfectly acceptable to use an iPhone or an iPad or any type of smart device to take a picture with. So the other thing you want to think about is your light source, whether it's artificial or whether it's natural, like using a window in your home. Those are two different options. My suggestion for starting out is with one of these small video lights. They offer continuous light, so it's not like a flash, so you can kind of set up everything as you see the light is. I've got for $35 on Amazon. It's a great little light source. You can dial it down to make less light or dial it up to make more light. It takes six AA batteries and it can be used on a stick or just like this. I use it just like this. The third thing in terms of gear is really what are you going to be taking pictures of outside of the food itself. So plates, utensils. I have quite a collection of different types of plates silverware, servingware, all sorts of things that I like to use when I'm taking my pictures. Less is more when it comes to food photography. You want the food itself to be the star of the show, but you want to display it in a way that's most appetizing. To do that, you want to think about colors and textures. Keep it to a minimum, but definitely introduce other colors and textures into your photography. So what I want to show you first is my basic food photography setup. What I typically use is this table right here in front of the window. What's great about this is it allows me to get right over top of it. So I have my phone charged and ready to take pictures. I'm also going to later show you how to use the DSLR. The first thing you want to do is turn off any lights in your house. Those are not suited for any kind of food photography. So just allow the only light source to be your window. Okay, so we're going to style this table. First thing is all white. So I have a lot of these rags that I got at uh, Target, basically. You can get them at Walmart or Target. And they're wrinkly kind of just the way I like them. So I'm going to start off by just positioning that as my tablecloth. It's showing through a little bit of the of the dark table itself. So I'm going to add just another one. <clears throat> These have great texture and if you absolutely feel like you need to iron them, iron them definitely. If you want a very smooth and clean look, iron these. But I, what I'm going for is texture, so that's what we're going to work with. So as of here, our only light source is the window. So we're going to continue to add pieces as we go. arranged here is something very simple, something you don't even need to cook. So this is a great way to get started practicing. 
I've added a couple different layers of things, which layers are good. You don't want too many layers, but layers are good. So I created a plate with a bowl in the middle and eggs. Now these are raw eggs, but I don't plan on taking a very long picture, so I'm going to put these back in the fridge when I'm done. I also added a terrine of salt, and I, I poured the salt in in such a way that it piles up in the middle. So what I'm looking for is something simple. There's lots of white. This glass is jet black. It may or may not be useful to have that in there because it's so different than everything else, but I did have a black handle on my knife. So I thought maybe we'll make that work. So what I'm looking to do, and a lot of times I post to Instagram, so I'll choose the square option. And I never post directly. I always edit my photos within the camera. So I'm going to do a straight down picture. And I, I, I've decided I don't want that glass there. As I'm looking through the viewfinder, seeing that that's not what I want. So you also want to think about the actual way you arrange these things. Typically, you want to go with odd numbers if you can. I went with three dishes. That's entirely up to you what you think is maybe too much or not enough you can add. So I'm going to look, look through my viewfinder again and decide, you know, what, what angle do I want to how is this going to look best? And do I want to include the entire plate or crop off little bits of things? So, so what we have here is a nice composition. There's angles going this way and the napkins going that way. So we have a nice intersection. We have a lot of white, but that blue is really popping off. So it's also it's almost become the focal point. So what I want to do is I want to rearrange it so that the eggs are the focal point. I've rearranged this just a little bit. Actually quite a bit. I rearranged this to where <clears throat> I've taken one of the eggs out. Picture and show you. If this were um, if this were a cooked egg, whoops. if this were a cooked egg, I would cut it open and show the inside of it. But considering that it's not a cooked egg, we're going to just let one be by itself. So we have the odd number thing again. Um, I've created an odd number situation here. One, two, three. We have one here and three here. And this going across here, I've created a diagonal, which is a little bit more interesting arrangement. Now, if you want to, and of course, like I said, this is square format. We'll change this to a, um, a regular rectangular format. Okay, so with the rectangular format, I've created slightly different orientation. So I could rework that and rework that and rework that until I get it just to where I like it. So throughout the next little while, I'm going to set up different orientations with different foods and show you how I'm doing it, kind of in fast motion.
Some of you may be a lot like me and decide to cook or bake at night after dark. So you don't have the available window light that we were talking about earlier. And you probably want to invest in some lighting. Now there's a lot of different types of lighting that you could use. I showed you the video light earlier, which is a great small source of light. But if you're looking for something bigger um, that puts out a lot more light, then a stand light is the way to go. Now these run between $50 and $500. So if you are interested, I again say start small, start out with what your budget can afford, or maybe look into borrowing some lights from someone else. This light has a diffuser on it. So um, if you ever see that with the diffuser, that's a great addition. And it should come with all soft boxes, and they're called soft boxes because they have the diffuser. So make sure you get one with a diffuser. It diffuses the light so it's not so harsh. It makes a much prettier light. So we're going to position the light. I want to also think about where I'm positioning the light in terms of where I'm going to be, so I'm not blocking the light itself. I'm also going to use the second light. To get a little bit more on the subject. So now I have my light positioned. I want to make sure I'm not in the path of the light. And I'm going to take a picture from here and just make sure I'm, I'm looking at the subject itself to see that everything that I want to be lit is correctly lit and positioned in the way that I want it positioned. So maybe instead of three walnuts, arranging these because in like size order. So I might want to put the cranberry, then the pistachio, and then the sunflower seed so that they're kind of in the same alignment as the bowl. Now I'll take a picture and show you what I mean. So here we are with the picture, and you can see all the nuts there. And maybe that's not interesting enough, maybe it's too boring to have it in a line. Maybe I'll have it in more of a group. Maybe I want to get a closer up shot of those five things with just part of the bowl. Now with something like this, you may want to consider having a DSLR because with the difference in height between these two items or these two levels, you can get depth of field, which can't be achieved with the cell phone quite as easily. So that's a great picture where these nuts are in focus and these are out of focus. And I can take that a step further by actually getting closer. And so by zooming out and getting closer, physically closer to the subject, I've created an entirely different amount of uh, depth of field there. So I have a couple different versions of that that I can work with. All I want to get is a little bit closer. All I want to know is
morning again and it's time to do another food setup. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about the DSLR camera and the benefits of having one and using one. So this is mine. I use both Canon and Nikon. People ask me quite often which one's better. There's really, really, they're both great, great cameras. Uh, they, they both make very powerful cameras and it's really a personal preference. In terms of the price, you get what you pay for. So if you purchase a cheaper Nikon or Canon, you're not going to get a lot of the bells and whistles or the quality that you would get with a more expensive one. And think about what you're going to be doing with it. Will you ever be wanting to do video? And since I do video, I chose this particular Canon. It's the 6D camera. One thing that you need to know is how to use your DSLR in manual mode because you'll get the best quality pictures in manual mode. So the first things you want to understand is what ISO is. ISO stands for International Standards Organization, which really means absolutely nothing. But when you're thinking about ISO, that's the first thing you're going to set. And you want to understand how bright the area is that you're going to be shooting in. Now our eyes are similar to the camera but our eyes are automatically adjusting and focusing for different light changes. So our ISO, think of it this way, is the sun on. ISO is the sun on. So right now the sun is on but we're not directly in it. So we're indoors with indirect light. You'll typically prefer to use indirect light much prettier with food photography. So ISO settings go from 100, which would be a bright white sandy beach um, at noon in the middle of summer. So the brightest possible setting would be 100 ISO. And that would be the most bright situation you could possibly imagine. And that goes to the other spectrum, which is, I would go up to about 1600. You can go higher, but the higher ISO number, you typically the less light you have available to you. And the higher number, you add a lot of grain. Now, grain is great for an artistic viewpoint, an artistic look, but typically with food photography, you don't want a lot of grain. So Keeping the highest point at 1600, if it gets too dark, add some light, add some artificial light to what you already have with natural light. So I try to stay within the 800 range. I get a nice contrast, lighting, everything works as long as I have enough lighting uh, available to me. So after ISO is set, so for this particular scenario, I'm setting it at 800. The next thing you want to notice is both your shutter speed and your aperture. Now your aperture is the opening that allows light to come in. So when you take a picture, it opens and closes. The speed at which it opens and closes is the shutter speed. So when you set your uh, aperture, also known as your f-stop, you're going to want to set it depending on the situation. Now, a lower number f-stop lets more light in. So if you have a low lit situation, you can have a lower number f-stop or a wider aperture. If it was, like I said, at the beach and you're on white sand, then you want a higher aperture. It m makes a smaller opening which lets less light in. Also, what happens with the aperture is it can affect the 
depth of field, which makes things that are farther away look blurrier. And that increases through the aperture, and it also increases the distance the, cam the camera is physically away from what it's focusing on. Now the shutter speed is what I consider the most variable and easy to adjust in small increments. So the shutter speed is how fast the aperture opens and closes. And it's measured in fractions. So if you are looking at your camera and your shutter speed is at 200, that's actually one two hundredth of a second. So it's going to take the picture, the aperture is going to open and close in one two hundredth of a second. And that's very fast. I say don't go under 30, one thirtieth of a second. I try to stay 60 or one sixtieth of a second because your if you're shaking, your hand is shaking at all, if there's any movement in what you're taking a picture of, it's going to turn into a blur or it's going to look blurry. And there's not a fix for that in Photoshop, folks. ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. So let's get started with our bread. Pretty beautiful. I'm going to take this from a different angle. Now the problem, part of the problem is the uh, sun is right in my eyes coming from above. So I'm going to get that out of my way. I can work with. It's much brighter. I want to show a little bit more of the texture of the bread. much closer and I have a much more shallow depth of field. In other words, this bread is going to be in focus to the point that this bread is completely out of focus. So um, the area that's in focus is just the middle of this bread right now. Another one a little bit lower. Now, if I decided I wanted all the bread in focus, I'm going to run the risk of having this background in focus, which is fine. 
So what I'm going to do to accomplish that is I'm going to increase my aperture or my f-stop to about 10, but then I'm going to need to adjust my shutter speed to compensate for that. So I'm at aperture 10 or f10 and my shutter speed is at 8. But still a nice, nice picture of that. The bread is more focused, the knife with the butter is more focused, but this is not as much in focus. So here we have our setup for this beautiful cake that I want to take lovely pictures of, but I want the cake to be the star clearly. So I've done two things. I've created a table top here on the end of my bar in my kitchen, rather than using that low table, that small table, because I can take up a lot more space here. Um, and I've used that black fabric that I used earlier to create a backdrop. Now, what I've done here is I just used a table, a folding table, and set it up on my counter in the exact spot that I was decorating this cake. So I just moved the cake from here to here. Now, I have both my window light and this light available to me because I want to get the best possible look. I've got my shot with my cell phone. Now I want to get it with my camera. Well, that wraps up this food photography video. I hope you've been well educated and aren't afraid to get started trying with at least a window and a smartphone.